Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the scripture that allows us an opportunity to touch base with you and how you want us to live our lives and how you want us to further your kingdom. We ask you to be with Dana today as he proclaims the word that he, you have set forth for him to say, help it enlighten and embolden us to be your missionaries throughout this community and elsewhere. We thank you and praise you for all your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Colossians, first chapter, verse 15 through 18. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is head of the church, the body. Excuse me, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have supremacy. The Holy Scriptures read to you. Glory to God. Amen. Thanks. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been re responsible to lead a group and found it difficult. Sometimes if you're in a situation like that, people are heading every which way, you call it herding cats, right? <laughs> My favorite Super Bowl commercial was from the year 2000. It was when those rough and rugged cowboys were cat wranglers and they were on their horses and they had a big herd of cats that they were herding. And uh, the, the commercial ends saying, uh, you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost to one of them, ain't a feeling like that in the world. <laughs> anyway, great commercial if you haven't seen it, Herding Cats. There's another good cat commercial out now that a friend just told me about. It's uh, this guy and his cat, but the cat kind of acts like a dog. He says, come here, Walter, and the cat jumps into the truck. Next thing you know, they're in the marsh duck hunting. He's 12 o'clock, Walter, like the cat's going to go bring back the bird. Then the cat has chased the neighborhood cats into a tree. He says, Walter, you're scaring them. And then Walter's on the front of the boat while he's cruising through the lake, nose into the wind. Then Walter pushes the tennis ball between his feet. Okay, one more throw. Next thing you know, Walter's rustling up cattle and moving that calf with the herd to get him into the stall, taking a nap on the tailgate of the truck with him. And then finally, at the end of this hard day, they make it to the lake where an older man is fishing and the man throws his stick to his cat and the cat goes jumping off the dock into the lake and catches the stick. The fisherman says, that's amazing. And the guy says, yeah, look at the tailgate of this truck. Uh, no, you know, your cat is amazing. So Walter, w when it comes to responding to leadership, we want to be more like Walter and less like an ordinary cat. <laughs> Cats are independent. They come, they go, you don't, they don't, you know, chase sticks or beg or roll over, play dead. Cats are just cats. They do what they want to do, which includes eating and, you know, what, what, when they want to do it. 
And so herding cats is <laughs> a challenge. But when uh, God's gift of leadership is working, then suddenly the impossible becomes possible and we become a lot more like Walter and less like ordinary cats. So let's talk about how the spiritual gift works. And uh, I see already just a little bit of fear in your eyes, <laughs> which is good. This is a gift uh, that was one of the two problem gifts in the church in Corinth. This is the last sermon in the gifts on the Holy Spirit. The entire series has been taken out of 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14. We're looking at one situation in the Bible, one letter that Paul wrote. And so all of the gifts that we're describing are the ones that he's mentioned in that section. And in this letter to the Corinthians, there are a couple of problems that Paul is addressing. One is problems related to the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues. It's a demonstrative gift that makes you look spiritual. And so some people were uh, maybe bringing glory to themselves or creating division. There were some problems with how that gift was functioning. But another gift was leadership. That gift was causing problems in the church because some were saying, I'm with Paul, I'm with Apollos. I follow this leader, I follow that leader. And this wonderful gift of leadership was not being stewarded in a way that was consistent with the truth of how it functions. So that little bit of fear in your eye is appropriate. It's one of those gifts that we need to have the grace of God to receive in a way that's really useful. So what is it? What is this gift of leadership? Now the word that's translated in the latest NIV is helping, is also translated administration or management or governance or leadership, the gift of leadership. It's a Greek word that literally means the pilot of a ship, a la the kids sermon today. Uh, in Acts chapter 27, when the centurion is referring, uh, conferring, talking with the pilot of the ship about whether they should sail at the wrong time of year against Paul's wishes, that word for pilot of the ship is the same word that's used here for the spiritual gift of leadership. Uh, what that means is that one person is leading and everybody else is stuck. <laughs> That's one image of leadership. We're going to talk about another. But the word that's used is a person that has a sense of direction and everybody's with them. Now, the early church loved to draw pictures of a boat with people in it and Jesus at the steering wheel. They said, this is the church. Jesus is steering the church. This is the same church that's being thrown to the lions and being persecuted through these storms of being the first Christians in the world, hated by uh, unbelieving Jews, hated by Gentiles, and loved by God. Through all their troubles, they said, no, you can't startle us, you can't scare us. Jesus is at the wheel here. Jesus is steering this ship, and we are completely confident that we're going to make it to our destination. Jesus has a sense of direction here. Now, as I mentioned, Acts chapter 27, it's a, a passage that I mentioned a few weeks ago talking about miracles. It's the part of the Bible where the Apostle Paul is a prisoner being taken to Rome, and he's on a ship with other prisoners. The Holy Spirit informs Paul that it's not a good idea to sail the wrong time of year, and they shouldn't do it. But oddly enough, the centurion, the, the head soldier in charge of all the uh, prisoners, sides with the experienced boat captain rather than the prisoner and off they go into the waters where they face a deadly storm and they all would have died except the pilot of the ship was not really the pilot god is the pilot jesus is the one steering the ship god governs the whole universe god is the leader of the universe so when we understand this spiritual gift, the first thing to note is that the church is not led by you or me or anybody but Jesus. The church is led by Jesus. Jesus is the pilot of the ship. That passage in Colossians that talks about the exalted nature of Jesus and ends with the idea that he's the head of the church. I included that as a reference to the Greek word that says boat pilot. That is Jesus. The church is steered by Jesus. 
Another example comes from a, a message that Juanita Bynum spoke. She's a, a gospel singer and speaker, and she was once a flight attendant, and she was talking to this group of people and said, when the plane is going down, she'd been through some really serious turbulence situations that were life-threatening, and uh, the plane was out of control for some moments. When people start crying out, they don't say, oh, pilot. Oh, pilot. They say, oh, God. We know intuitively that the Lord is the one who steers the whole universe, and Jesus Christ steers the church. So as we try to understand what this gift of leadership means, and a little bit of fear in your eye, like, oh, no, <laughs> we're in trouble. Don't worry. Whatever we decide on, whatever we come to discover about what the Scripture says with the spiritual gift of leadership, it will never contradict the foundational truth that God is the ruler of all and Jesus Christ is the head of the church. So the first metaphor, the first thought for us to, to hold in our minds as we're thinking about the spiritual gift of leadership is that the church is safely in Jesus' hands. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Anything that manifests, that shows itself in the church as a gift of leadership will not usurp that. Nothing that is a gift of God will usurp that foundational truth. The next thing you need to know about this Greek word for boat pilot, the next message that this word gives is that the gift of leadership, when you see it, will be a gift that manifests a sense of direction. We're going this way. This is the way to go. I, I, I can see I'm steering this way. I know that we need to go from point A to point B. So if you have vision that's coming from somebody, watch and see, is this an upwelling of God's grace? I've been speaking about all of these gifts with the same metaphor, the same word picture. Imagine under the street, there's the water pipe that carries the water to your house and it bursts and the water shoots into the street. The Holy Spirit is present in the church always, but there are moments when it wells up and a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, a miracle, a healing, a speaking in utterance in a language that's unknown. There is a, a charism, a manifestation of God's grace that happens in the life of the church. And it happens with service, and it happens with teaching, and it happens with leadership, these ordinary gifts. So if somebody suddenly has a sense of direction, test and discern and see if perhaps the Spirit of God is bringing this gift. Okay, so that's the first metaphor, hand on the steering wheel, Jesus steering the ship. The second is that of the shepherd, what we read in the 23rd Psalm. The overarching, largest image for what leadership looks like in the Bible is that of shepherding. King David was called a shepherd of God's people, and Ezekiel 34 through 36, when the prophet is talking about the demise of God's people, how they went astray and broke God's covenant, the prophet Ezekiel says, all these shepherds were corrupt. They were supposed to be feeding the sheep, and instead they were, uh, they were like parasites feeding off of the sheep. They were destroying that which they were meant to protect. And he's referring to the priests and the kings and the false prophets, those who are in leadership. They're shepherds. Now, a shepherd doesn't use a cattle prod, as far as I know. <laughs> At least the uh, ancient Israelite shepherds. I don't even think they had dogs. They led. Shepherds lead. They don't push. When a shepherd brings a group of sheep from point A to point B. They're in the front, and the sheep are drawn to the shepherd. They know that's where the safety is. I was watching a video of traditional shepherding, some, some old guys out in an open space with a crude shed where they would milk the sheep to make the cheese and uh, get the you know, proceeds from shepherding. And they talked about how when you pull those sheep into the milking shed, you have to be sweet to them. Like a mother, you have to sing songs and talk to them like they're kindergartners and pet them because they have to want to come into the milking shed. You can't be rough with the sheep. That really is the image of shepherding. It's gentle care and it's concern for the strays and it's going after the lost. Ezekiel 34 through 36, when the prophet is saying, this was wrong, what you did, it was talking about harsh shepherds that were cruel and selfish. A shepherd is charismatic 
That means they draw. They pull people toward them. That word, charismatic, just drops like a, like a care package from heaven on this passage because it intersects the very concept of a spiritual gift with leadership. We talk about leaders who are charismatic. Leaders who are charismatic inspire trust and they draw people to them. That's what shepherding is. And the word charismatic is the word that I'm using when I'm talking about the upwelling of God's grace. It, it's a charismata. That's what a spiritual gift is. It's a charism. It's, it's the uh, grace of Jesus that comes in a certain expression. When it comes in leadership, that is a shepherding kind of leadership, it draws people. Of course, we use that word charismatic to refer to devils as well as angels. There are uh, cult leaders and dictators and horrible people who have been charismatic leaders, meaning they could lead people astray. It's good for us to remember that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Lucifer, that means the light bearer. The devil is a person who can sing sweet songs as well as throw cruel punches. And so... What brings us back to the very beginning of the conversation that we had about all spiritual gifts at the very beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The Apostle Paul is about to describe spiritual gifts so that he can help this church bring itself into adjustment to enjoy all the charisms of God's grace without having a problem with leadership or tongues. And he says to the church in Corinth, in the past, you worshiped idols. You were led astray by idols. You had all kinds of spiritual experiences. You were in contact with spirits, but it wasn't the Holy Spirit. But now you need to know that nobody says by the Spirit of God, Jesus be cursed. Nobody says foot washing, be cursed. Nobody says servanthood, be cursed. Nobody says righteousness, be cursed. Nobody says courage, be cursed. Nobody says Jesus be cursed by the Spirit of God. In the same way, uh, nobody says Christ is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Nobody says uh, that this self-sacrifice, this righteousness, this mediator relationship that God has with us through Jesus, that that be cursed. Nobody says all that Jesus represents be cursed uh, with the Holy Spirit. And nobody says uh, except by the Holy Spirit that that is Lord, that Jesus is Lord. So when a sense of vision and direction starts to come among God's people, and when a charisma starts to come, when people are drawing others with a sense of enthusiasm, like Al Badgley had with the can today, right? That was great, because that really is an example uh, of the charism of leadership, the spiritual gift of leadership. Uh, you see... This is one of those sermons that a pastor preaches that can be a little dicey. If I preach about tithing, it's a little dicey, right? Because that's how I make my living. <laughs> that's how people give, and that's how I don't have to work, a, you know, a side job full time. I can devote myself to ministry. So if I'm preaching about it, it's a little conflict of interest, right? Well, same with leadership, because it looks like I'm sort of a boss here. Well, two things. One is that every Christian is a sort of a leader. Everybody who has the Holy Spirit is in a position of leadership because Jesus said, you are the light of the world and you're the salt of the earth. The whole world is looking to you. And people will give praise to your Father in heaven by your good deeds, by the things that are inspired by the Holy Spirit. So when Al Badgley comes up, not knowing he was going to be liturgist and holds up this can, he's got this bright idea and he's leading us with some charisma, that's it. That's that gift, and it can happen to you too. So when it happens, you want to know it's not about a strong personality. It's not about a natural kind of charisma. It's when the Lord stirs it up by the Holy Spirit, and it, you can tell that its fruit exalts Jesus and the way of Jesus, the character of Jesus, the plan of Jesus, the direction of Jesus, because Jesus himself is the head of the church. All right, so... Uh, the, the, the net result, in, in conclusion, when we recognize that this gift is from the Spirit, that it's not a personality or a natural-born ability, that it comes through the Spirit, and then we can become a bit more like Walter. And uh, 
We can be led readily. We can do the things that people say, no, people won't go for that. People don't do that. Nobody's courageous enough to try that. Nobody will go there. Walter will go there. <laughs> and we can be a community like that as well. I, I, I missed one little point I, I wanted to say, and that is me standing up here uh, tricking you into thinking I'm a leader. Well, I am a leader, but we're Presbyterian. And the Presbyterian Church is governed by ruling elders. We've got six of them right now. And pastoral staff also serve as elders. So there's eight of us. So imagine this little boat up here with eight hands on the steering wheel. All right, there's a rock up there. We should turn right. Let's vote. <laughs> you know, it's a little less efficient than just one person. But the, that's the downside. The upside is that that and follow this if you will god invented prayer think about this god can do everything without your help he created you without your help he decided what your personality would be like what your tendencies would be like what your dna would be and without any input from you knit you together in your mother's womb and god doesn't need help for anything and yet he says let my people pray and let them really pray crying out like a widow in her distress over and over again. Oh, righteous judge, give me justice. It's because the Lord in God's character, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a God of love, a God of community, has decided to share his governing authority and share his rule with his inheriting children. And Jesus said, you've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of 10 cities. God has given you the, the grace to govern with him. And so our elders who you can pray for, when it works right, we're not just making decisions, we're discerning. Jesus, the one with his hands on the steering wheel, the one leader of the one church is going this direction. And we have determined by testing the spirits that our best guess about what Jesus is doing is to decide like this. So far, so good. <laughs> you can always pray for us. But as we discern this gift and receive it as a gift, without the human pride of calling leadership just the force of personality or the will to power, but calling it a gift from heaven, then we can do the impossible. We can be those that jump in and go with the Lord where others wouldn't. Sound good? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you in your kindness to give us this charism, this gift. Father, we confess that we have not always been faithful when you've stirred this gift up. And we've depended on worldly things and had worldly eyes and looked to human pride instead of that which comes from your spirit. We confess our sin and ask for your grace to repent and not to go that way but to discern, to see the way you're steering the ship and to follow, to follow. Give us courage. Help us to be like Jesus. Lord, when Jesus is leading, we know that even if it leads into a storm, we'll get to where we need to get to. We'll go to where we're supposed to go. Make us courageous sailors and help us to be wise leaders. We pray that you would help us to be good stewards of this gift and you give it to us not based on our worthiness but just based on your merciful gracious giving character we pray this in jesus name amen